Welcome to Real Talk, where I give real answers to real questions from real worship leaders. If you are a real worship leader with a real question and you want a real answer, this series thrives on your input. So submit your question right here for your future episode, and I'll probably answer it. Got some good questions this week? Let's talk about it. Would love to see a video on your philosophy slash position on the placement of announcements and offertory in the worship service. Regarding your most recent video, I agree starting with announcements isn't great, but previously at my church, we would present announcements after the worship music set before the sermon, which was even worse in my opinion. Now we have an opening song, announcements and offertory, then the rest of the worship music set, then the sermon. This feels disjointed as well, Robert. Well, as always, I've got to pick apart the question. Don't I always do that? Uh, There's two things you're talking about. You're not just talking about announcements. I have very strong feelings about announcements in in the service, but you also tied that with offering. And I think what, what you're missing and what you need to think about when it comes to offering is that offering is an act of worship. Announcements, not an act of worship. Offering, that's worship. And it should not be a byline in your worship service. You're like, I, we do announcements and offering at the beginning. That's fine, but when, when you separate offering from the rest of the worship service, it sounds to me like the way that you explained it. It's like, hey, welcome everybody. We're going to take offering real real quick, and then we're good to start worship, right? Like, no, offering should be a moment in your worship service. Not at the beginning. It's not something separate. We aren't just collecting money because that's what we do on a Sunday. We are giving to God because he commands us to. On the first day of the week, set aside collections. This is the the commandment that I'm talking about. And so I just wanted to bring that up. I think your question is more about announcements, but you tied offering with that. I would not tie offering with announcements, although sometimes those things go beside each other in the service, but they need not go beside each other in the service. I don't do that in my service. We've actually been talking recently about how to implement a more focused time of giving in our services because it's so hard these days because people just give online or we have a box, which kind of started for a lot of churches during COVID when they weren't passing the plates around. We all just set up a box in the back of our church and it kind of becomes like this this private act that you do by yourself when really it's like it should be a corporate act that we do together or at least recognize together, which is why I'm trying to move right now more to a time of prayer for the giving so that we can focus on making that an act of worship and not just something like announcements. So that being said, let's get to announcements. Here's my problem with announcements is that there's so many other ways to communicate things. And I'm not, I want to make it clear, I'm not saying that nothing should ever be communicated event-wise from the stage. There are things that we need to communicate to our church. Does it need to happen on a weekly basis? I don't, I don't think so. We don't do weekly announcements at my church, and I have felt no effects from that. Our church has felt no effects from that. If there's something big coming up at the church, then we'll talk about it. We might do that at the beginning of the service, depending sort of on what's happening in the service during the day. Like if if we were going to have like communion after the sermon, then we might do announcements at the beginning or something like that. It, It really just depends. Or we might do announcements before the sermon because it makes sense for our pastor to come up and briefly give some announcements if there's something specific happening. Like, for instance, we did uh, our fall festival, which was like sort of like a trunk or treat last year, where we really wanted everybody in the church involved in that. And so we announced that leading up to it multiple times, actually. And that happened at the beginning of the service sometimes. That happened before the pastor's message sometimes on Sunday. So either of those two spots, I think, works just logistically, uh, whatever works better for your church. I don't think that there's a perfect time to do it. I haven't found a perfect time to do it. I could even see doing it at the end. Sometimes we do it at the end of our service too. Now that I think about it, our pastor will come up and he'll say, hey, before you go, I just want to remind you, we've got this coming up this week. We've got a night of worship coming up tonight if we're having a night of worship that night or whatever it is. So I think it can be like, you know, a quick thing at the end. Here's my problem with announcements, though, is there are so many other ways to communicate those things that 
I think we take like the the scatter shot approach like here's like a shotgun approach where we need to announce it on Facebook and we need to announce it on Instagram and we need to put an announcement through our email list which I actually think is probably the best way to do it we need to have it in our bulletin we need to talk about it before our service starts we need to have it up on the announcement slides before the service starts we need to have it on a plaque in the bathroom behind the urinal so that guys can stare at it while they go to the bathroom <laughs> that's something that that we've done or not here but at my old church we did and it's it's actually pretty effective because where else are you going to look while you're going to the bathroom but my point is there are so many other ways to communicate and probably more effective ways to communicate written written events written announcements are more effective than your pastor getting up there and saying i, I mean how many times have you heard this church we have a bible study starting up going to be on the book of Job. It's happening next Wednesday at 6.30 in conference room B. And it's like, I'm never going to remember that. Send me an email and I'll look at it and then I can refer back to that. But most people aren't writing that down. I could rant about announcements forever. Really, communication forever. All right, here's what you need to do to be effective in communication in your church. You need an email list and you need to utilize your email list. Email, whether you like it or not, is the one thing that everybody checks. And I know and somebody's gonna be like, I never check my email. Okay, well, mature adults, I will say that, mature adults who are below the age of 70 or something, uh, they, they check their email. And many above the age of 70 do as well because email has become the preferred way that we communicate. It's just what we do. You get up every morning and you check your email to see if you have have any important information, all right? This is just how we communicate in the world today. So your church should have an email list. Ideally, you should be sending out, if you, if you have events every week at your church, send out a weekly email that says, this is what's coming up at our church. And I know some churches are like, well, I don't wanna bother people with that. Like, it's kind of spammy. It's not spammy. All right, I, as somebody who has an email list, I have an email list for leading worship well, and I send out a decent amount of emails, and I always send out an email when a new video comes out. That's probably why you're watching this right now. It's not spam. People who signed up for my email list, they want to hear from me because they care about what leading worship well is, is doing and what I, what I put out. The people in your church, even more so, if they sign up for your email list, they want to know what's happening at your church. So send out an email, and it's not too crazy to send out an email every single week. That's not, that's not spam. That's good communication. So I guess to wrap up my thoughts on announcements, have as few announcements as possible. I only announce things, I only want things announced that pertain to the entire church or at least like half of the church. If there's like a men's or women's event, then we should announce those things. But I've seen so many times people announce every little thing that's happening in their church. There's a prayer meeting happening this night. The quilting group is getting together on Tuesday morning, uh, so on and so forth. Like. Not everybody cares about that. Not everybody needs to know about it. Send out an email. If you do have a church-wide event that is important enough to announce, then announce it either at the beginning, when your pastor gets up on stage. You could do it during a time of, uh, like, welcome. Some people have a time of welcome to their church. I don't really prefer that time, but you could do that, or at the end of your service. There is no good spot for announcements. I think that we've come to that conclusion. Nobody has found a good spot for announcements. Send out an email. Stop announcing so many things in church. That's my, that's my humble opinion. How do you downgrade a band member who refuses to improve? Interesting uh, language there, downgrade. I'm not really sure what that means. It's like I don't know how you downgrade a, a band member. Here's the language I would use for that. How do I raise up a band member so that they are proficient musically? And then, if they refuse, which you said they refuse to improve, what do I do with that band member? And at that point, it's not a member. It's not a matter of 
downgrading, like you don't play as much, or I don't know, I don't schedule as much, but that's the only thing I think of when it comes to downgrading. It is, we make a commitment to being excellent at our instruments on the team. This is spelled out explicitly in our worship team code of conduct, and I'm willing to work with you. You know, I, let's say this person's a guitar player and they're struggling switching between chords. I'm willing to work with you. And I will continue to work with you as long as you make the effort to improve because I want you to be on the team. But we need to meet a certain threshold where it allows us to lead worship in an undistracting way. Once we become a distraction to the worship gathering, our purpose up there is is hindered as worship leaders because we point people to the worthiness of God and provide them with the opportunity to respond. When we constantly make mistakes, it takes the eyes off of God. I'm not saying that it should happen this way. We should be able to worship through distractions, but if it happens consistently, what we're doing is taking the attention off of God and placing it onto ourselves in, an, in a negative way because we aren't adequate musically to play. So that's one thing, but then we also are supposed to provide the opportunity to respond. And whenever we make mistakes like that, constantly, I'm not saying you can never make a mistake. I make mistakes, but when we do it habitually over and over and over and over again, people see that and they hear it and it distracts them from responding. Once again, I'm not saying that it should be that way, but it's just our human nature. And not only that, but we're giving our best to God. So let's give our best to God. So it's not the fact, simply the fact, that somebody isn't musically at the place where they need to be to lead undistracting worship or to lead with undistracting excellence, as I've heard it said before, but it is the fact also that they refuse to improve and get to that point. Oh, now, which, what should you do about it? I just talked about the, the foundational stuff, but what should you actually do about that situation? Number one, it starts not with this person who is already on the team, but with the next person who's going to join the team. Do you have a process for getting them onto your team or not allowing them to be on your team because they don't meet the minimum threshold? There is a minimum threshold, just like I talked about, I won't repeat myself. There's a minimum threshold that we need to meet to be able to lead musical worship. If we can't meet that minimum threshold of musical excellency where we lead in a non-distracting way, then th we shouldn't be on the worship team. We should go find somewhere else to serve where we are actually gifted, all right? And I'm going to say that. like, If you're not gifted in, in music, you should not be leading musical worship. And I know some people disagree with that, but that's, that's the facts, all right? We, we don't just get to serve in an area of the church because we want to. We serve there because we're gifted in it. And you're actually lying to the person who wants to join your team who's not gifted in that way. You're not allowing them to use their actual gifts somewhere else because they're pouring themselves into the, the worship team, pouring themselves into the worship team when they aren't gifted in that way. And the hand wants to become a foot, and the foot wants to become an eye to use some biblical language. So help people find their giftedness if they don't meet that minimum threshold. And you need to have a process before somebody joins the team to vet them, to see if they meet that minimum threshold. And I'm not saying they have to be the most amazing worship musician in the world. I'm just saying that they shouldn't be making mistakes left and right. So it starts there. Now, for the person who's already on your team, you've just got to be clear with them. It comes back to clarity. What are the problems that you notice? Can you articulate them? Once again, you didn't say what this band member does on your team. Let's say they're a singer and they are constantly flat, or they forget the words all the time, or you send them harmony parts to learn, or enough resources so that they can learn the harmony parts, and they are always wrong on their harmony parts. Whatever it is, you've got to go to them one-on-one. -on -one. We don't do this in front of the team, obviously, and say, hey, can we talk after worship rehearsal this week? sit down with them, and you have the hard conversation. And you say, hey, you know, I've kind of noticed some things musically that I want to work with you on because I think that we can improve these things. And I want to point you to some resources that I think will help us sound even better as a band. So 
a couple of things that I noticed is, you know, you're not quite hitting the harmonies that that we're aiming for. And so I wanna point you to whatever resource you have and do that for, for each of their problems and then check in with them consistently and see if they are improving. And then, like you said, if they aren't improving, then you have another hard conversation and say, listen, guitar player who struggles to get between the chords, it just, I notice like every time you go to switch a chord, like it takes you a second to get there. And that's just something that we really need to have down as a baseline whenever we're leading people in worship because it can be a distraction when people are hitting wrong chords and things like that. And so I've talked to you about this like three times now. And I mean, what, what steps are you taking to improve that? And once again, don't come at it like, offensively attacking the person, but ask them like, what can I do to help? And if they're like, oh, nothing, I'm good, like, or they're defensive about it, then you've got to be firm as the worship team leader and say, it's not good. <laughs> you're, not, you're not at a place musically where it's edifying to the church. And we need to get to that place. It's okay to have that conversation eventually. Once again, I wouldn't start there. I'm not like going up to worship team members and saying, you're the worst singer, you're the worst guitar player in the world. No, we work with them gently and try to get them to a place. But if they don't get to that place because they have refused to try to improve, then I have no other option but to say for the health of our worship ministry, for the corporate worship gathering and the health of it for the church, we can't allow distracting musicians to continue on forever. Simple as that. Now, if you need some help putting together a system like I talked about that vets people before they get on the team, I put together the worship team toolkit. In that, you will find my worship team code of conduct. I'll link this down in the description below. My worship team code of conduct and my worship team application form. In these documents. You can take them and pretty much copy and paste them directly to your worship ministry. You just switch out the name of your church with what I have there and boom, you're good to go. That will allow you to hold people accountable to a lot of the things that I just talked about in this video. So check that out down in the description below, the worship team toolkit. Other than that, thanks so much for joining me. Till I see you in the next video, keep leading worship well.